Okay, well, hopefully everyone is, is in this, the Zoom session now. Um, again, my name is Michael Wallace. I am the director of the Emergency and Security Studies Program here at Tulane University. And we are thrilled uh, tonight to have you all uh, for the inaugural Emergency and Security Studies panel. Uh, tonight, we have two individuals who are simply outstanding in their field in the emergency management and security field. We have Mark Dupuy and Bradley Hubbard, and uh, they will introduce themselves in just a minute. I'd also like to, uh, to introduce Dr. Becky Rouse, who is the Associate Director of the Emergency and Security Studies Program here at Tulane. She just joined us uh, coming from FEMA. And Becky, would you like to say any words? Hello, thanks for coming. Have a great time tonight. And thank you very much. So if we can have the next slide. As I mentioned tonight, we have two outstanding panelists. Uh, we have Bradley Hubbard and Mark Dupuy. And I'll let Brad uh, tell you a little bit about himself and where he is, and then Mark. And then we'll, uh, we'll head into the panel. All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'm uh, living in New Orleans. I am an emergency response specialist for Shell Oil Company, and I support emergency preparedness and emergency response, uh, primarily for offshore operations in the Gulf of Mexico, but I'm part of a broader network that supports all lines of business across Shell. So for us, that means our offshore platforms and drilling rigs, as well as our refineries, our distribution terminals, shipping and maritime business, chemical transport, um, and onshore oil and gas production as well. I've uh, been with Shell for almost 13 years, always in an emergency response capacity. And excited to be here today and look forward to talking to you all a little bit more about uh, this career track and this profession. Okay, hey everybody, very excited to be here. My name is Mark Dupuy. I'm the Vice President, Chief of Security and Emergency Management for Oshner Health. So that includes everything with our name on it. Uh, 16 hospitals, 200 clinics, a med school, a nursing school, health center, and probably a whole bunch of things I forgot. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, emergency management uh, for the entire organization, uh, security for the entire organization. I also have some other duties we'll talk about later, but excited to be here and, and happy to talk to you. Back to you, Mike. Yeah, so uh, I'll kick this off and I think I already know the answer to this one, but I just wanna hear uh, what you all are gonna say. So in both your jobs, and we'll start with Brad, is there such a thing as a typical day? No, <laughs> direct answer, no. Uh, there's a lot of variety in our jobs and uh, we are still a response organization. So we're still subject to whatever's happening in the world around us and, and pivoting and reacting to those circumstances. We put a lot of emphasis on protection and a lot of emphasis on preparedness and prevention as well. So we spend a lot of our time building and maintaining systems um, to keep people safe and to be ready for an incident should one occur and certainly try to prevent it from occurring by having other systems in place as prevention methods. But that's one of the best things about this job. That there's a lot of variety in terms of the different facilities and people you work with and also the, uh, the types of, of issues that you're dealing with on a daily basis. Yeah, and Mark, uh, I'm curious to, to hear your answer on this one too. Well, I, th I think the answer is, is, is no, uh, but it's, it's a good no because uh, part of the reason, I'm sure Brad just said it, part of the reason you, you do this kind of feel is because you like the excitement. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it's not all excitement. A lot of it's uh, similar to Brad is spending time preparing and, and making sure your organization is, is ready for, for whatever might, might pose the next day. So, uh, so there's no really typical day, but that's kind of the, uh, the draw to the profession and, and to uh, what we do every day. So, Mark, was this, uh, I mean, did you always want to be in security and emergency management, or was this something that you just kind of uh, came into as your career uh, progressed? Well, um, the, the answer is yes, but I started out as a career police officer. So I was a police officer for 31 years, uh, which, as you know, being in law enforcement is very similar to emergency management. Uh, as I rose through the ranks, I, you know, more the, the leadership and planning of, uh, of, uh, Jefferson Parish Mardi Gras of the response to Hurricane Katrina um, really drew me, you know, it was my life's work and I loved it. And it was a very uh, kind of natural progression into what I'm doing now with, uh, you know, you, you're transi transitioning from the, the public sector into a private sector, but essentially doing the same thing uh, in preparing and, and preparing your organization 
are preparing uh, everyone to be safe and, and to survive uh, anything that presents itself. Brad, I know you've, you've had an interesting career. Sure, so I, I always knew that I wanted to be in some type of emergency response. I'm a bit of a cliche in that sense that I've been interested in this since I was a child and I became a firefighter and an EMT. Uh, and then progressed through the ranks there a bit, was able to uh, become a station lieutenant for the fire department and was able to get a little bit more leadership exposure, which then led me to be curious for bigger and more complex incidents and uh, programs. And I was working in the fire service congruently with going to university. And so I was able to pursue education at the same time. And so I, I always wanted to be involved in emergency response. I didn't know that it would look like this. But as I was seeking out bigger, more complex systems to be a part of, it was a natural draw to make the switch into the private sector and then to pursue um, emergency preparedness and response just under a little bit different brand than what I used to do. So for for you, Brad, what, what are you know what are some of the biggest challenges that that you deal with? And and you know I say that <laughs> looking back uh, almost a year now, we've been in, in COVID and and a lot of other things have been going on. So, you know, I'm sure things, the challenges change, but what, what are some of the challenges that you, you deal with? Yeah, I think the, the, the two answers to that question. First of all, I think that in our work, work, it's really easy to see a lot of opportunities that are out there to improve processes, to improve the system, and to find the ones that invest the energy in the ones that have the most value and to provide the most protection, the most support for the business. Um, or for the people in the organization, that's that's really an important niche to try to find and find that balance of the ones that add the most value. Um, I think another challenge that we work, we deal with a lot in our industry and in our chosen profession is that we're constantly having to react and adjust to the world around us. And that seems pretty obvious given that we're an emergency response, emergency preparedness. But as emergency management professionals, we're constantly making those adjustments and making adjustments to our systems to make sure that we have the right programs in place, the right controls or safety measures in place, and to try to maximize protection for our people, whomever that audience may be based on the organization you work for, and constantly adjusting to the external environment. So there's things out of our control and there's things that we can try to control to um, you know, keep ourselves as safe as possible and to continue to look out for our people. And, and Mark, you know, when you were introducing yourself, you're talking about all the different properties and hospitals and clinics that, that Oshner uh, has now, uh, what what are some of the challenges that you're facing? I think, uh, you know, again, similar to Brad, I think the challenges are, you know, trying to align uh, your preparedness, your mitigation, and even your security standards with the, the mission of the business and making that fit. So what I mean by that is, you know, uh, you know, you want to do certain things to prepare for an emergency or you want to put in certain security systems to protect them. How, you know, the, the, the question you're going to get from leadership, uh, especially on the corporate side, is, you know, why should I pay that money to do that? And you have to align it with the vision or the mission of the business. For us, it's taking care of patients. So that's to keep patients safe. If, if they don't feel safe, the, the nurses and doctors aren't going to be safe and we're not going to be able to fill our, our main mission. So um, and I said it's challenging because in, in, in the healthcare industry, despite what's going on right now, if I need a new uh, security tool or a new emergency management tool or, or folks, uh, I'm competing against maybe a new surgical tool that a, a surgeon needs. Uh, so you have to make sure uh, you have value and show value to the business need. Uh, and that's, that's, that's not always as easy as it sounds. It's, it can be a little challenging. Yeah, I'm sure uh, you know, the wrong time to have uh, emergency management and security management is, is after an event. So. Uh, I'm sure that's that's challenging for both of y'all. Um, you know, in your inter, in your introductions, you were talking about uh, both being on the public side and and now being on the private side. What are some of the similarities and differences that uh, you, you've encountered? And, and Mark, uh, if you want to start, yeah, I'm sure. I um, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, I always made. Uh, not made fun of this, but thought about, you know, in, in the law enforcement world, you know, we're keeping people safe, making arrests if we have to, patrolling, uh, but nowhere in there does it say we're making money. And I hate to ball it down like that because, you know, in, in healthcare or in any business, in business to, you know, you might have a greater mission of taking care of people, but in order to take care of patients or people, uh, you have to, you have to be safe and you have to be profitable. So, um, 
So a little bit back to my earlier comment, you have to tie in, in, the, in the public sector, you're doing it because for the good of the people, because you wanna take care of everybody, you want them to be safe. Uh, and then in the private sector, you're doing it for the mission of the organization. Uh, and, and hopefully the greater mission is something good like taking care of people, uh, whether it is or not, you just have to tie it to the organization's mission. And, and to me, that's the biggest difference. Yeah, do you, you find that, that even though it, it is in the private, you still touch the public side? Oh, absolutely. As you know, uh, as many in, in my particular organization, uh, you know, we have 30,000 employees and we're all over the state. Uh, so we certainly, and we have people visiting us, we have sick people, so certainly touch the public. So there is a connection there, uh, you know, uh, no matter which way you look at it. But I think it's not in all how you present what you need and how do you obtain the uh, preparedness tools and the security tools you need. And uh, Brad, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think you know, a couple of the differences that I experienced were just moving into a much larger organization in the private sector. Some people do it the other way around and make the switch. They're at a large bureaucratic government organization at the federal level. They might move to a smaller company. I did the reverse. I was in a smaller jurisdiction, moved into a very large corporate organization that has global remit. So that was the big learning curve for me to adjust to understanding the broader scope. Um, it's also a great opportunity as well. Um, I think that a lot of the things that are similar to and also similar to what Mark said, that the similarities in private sector and public sector still come down to the people. So those that are in this line of work are still working on the mission focus of protecting people, be it our people in our company, the, the community around us. And so there's a core mission that's aligned regardless of which uniform you're wearing or what the organization you represent. And that our people that, that we were working on to support work offshore, they work in refineries, they also live in the community around us. And so we're looking at people that are in living in the community that uh, are not part of our workforce because our facilities are in the community as well. And so really keeping a broad community mindset and understanding how we fit into a bigger picture and a broader sense of community is an important thing. And for me, that was helpful to have started on the government and community side and then make the move into private sector. So I think it helps to maintain that focus. Yeah. And so we're going we're gonna to move, change gears a little bit and kind of go uh, into your uh, backgrounds. Uh, you know, coming from a military background myself, uh, you know, when I went in service as a young ensign, uh, my first uh, division, I, I had mentors, and the, the number one mentor I had was the, uh, the senior enlisted, the chief petty officer. Um, if you didn't listen to him, you weren't going to go far. Uh, you also had senior officers that helped and, and things like that. But did you all, uh, you know, have a mentor and, and did you seek out this mentor or, or did the mentor kind of take you under their wing and uh, start with Brad? I was really fortunate to have two individuals that were um, mentors to me throughout my university years and the time spent in the fire service. And uh, one worked for the fire department that I was affiliated with, the other worked for the university that I was attending. So I, they kind of had me um, in perspective on both ends for me, which was really helpful. Um, and so Jeff and Diana were really, really instrumental in helping me to see a long-term vision that I wasn't able to see yet because I didn't have the life experience and I didn't necessarily know all the outlets and options and different paths that the career course could take over the years. And so they helped keep that alive and to foster ideas about what else could you go into? How could you use that? What's the best way that you could get to this point if that's your goal? So they asked a lot of questions that let me think through it, come up with what was best for me, but laid out options and helped me uh, gain visibility on things I wouldn't have otherwise been aware of. And, and Mark? Absolutely. I think it's, it's uh, I had one uh, was senior, a senior ranking officer for me, uh, but also a very uh, close friend and mentor. And, and I think, you know, what, what a mentor essentially does, it gives you a fresh set of eyes on, on your own self, uh, even if you're self-aware. It's very hard to see sometimes, uh, you know, the things you need to do, the things you don't know. And, you know, someone who has a, a lot of experience and cares for you and wants to see you succeed, can only help you. It can't hurt you. And I, and I would 100% agree that a mentor is, is at any stage of your career is helpful. I have one right now, uh, not the same one, but I have a new one right now that, uh, that, that I use even in my current position. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a lifelong. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I think, uh, I think Dr. Rouse is my mentor. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that's a perfect invitation for me to say. And gentlemen, when you look to mentor someone else, how do you develop that relationship? Well, uh, 
I, you know, I think it comes two ways. Sometimes you 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 get asked, and sometimes you offer. But when, when when I am mentoring someone, you know, I think the most important part of that is 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 when you first meet, and I ask the mentor, "What do you want to get out of this? What are you looking for?" Um, and and I think you know, you look to somebody. Oftentimes, it's not somebody in your exact field. At least if, at least for me, it hasn't been. Uh, and when, and maybe not an emer another emergency manager. It may be. Uh, an IT person or someone else. And, and I think that's sometimes uh, you may say, well, how can you help a person like that if that's not your field? Because you, you're talking about these big, big overarching uh, ideas and, and lessons learned and how to, many times it's, it's common no matter what field you're in. So I look for someone that I think I can help that wants to be helped and that has a clear vision of what they want uh, so that so I can help them more. Do you have anything to add, Brad? Yeah, I think that I look for individuals that have a lot of drive and want to get there. Um, they want to put in the work and they want, they want to learn, they want to grow. And that if somebody's going to show up and, and want to request a mentorship and to and start that relationship, I want to see that they're going to be proactive and they're going to be the ones to take the initiative to schedule the meetings. They're going to be the ones to uh, highlight things they're interested in. And I certainly would want to help them identify other things they may not have thought of, but I'm curious to know more about them and what, what they've come to the table with in terms of their ideas so that we can grow and build on that rather than the perception that the mentor is just going to tell them what to do. Because it really is their journey and their life. So it should be a matter of us providing things as mentors that help them get to their own goals. Yeah, and, and you know, I remember, um, again, being a young ensign and some of the best advice I received was, you know, uh, observe observe people and take the good qualities that you see that you would like and appreciate and don't take the bad qualities and the and the negative leadership qualities and things like that so uh i i totally agree with y'all you know and, and again keeping on this um um you know when you're first in the field what are some uh, lessons learned that uh, you wish you knew then that you know now and we'll start with Mark. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, my, mine's kind of rather simple, and it's going to sound that you're going to probably scratch your head, but mine is to ask for help. Um, and, you know, many times when you're young, at least in, in, in my experience, you know, you want to be able to do everything. You don't want to you think asking for help maybe looks weak, and somebody's going to think, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, but, you know, especially where I work now, I work with some brilliant people that take parts out of people's chests and put them back in. And, I, and I'm the first one now to ask for help. And I didn't always do that. I wish I would have done that earlier because uh, I think you don't have to do everything alone. Uh, you, you know, it helps. There's a lot of smart people around that can help you and, and have different uh, opinions and vantage points. And I think that that's kind of what I wish I would have known or done earlier. Brad? Yeah, I think a big lesson learned that I've had over the years, especially when I was younger and first starting out is to recognize that a lot of people can identify the problem and a lot of people can talk about good ideas that are out there, but to identify a problem and bring a solution or at least the beginnings of a solution are really important. And really to expand on what Mark had said earlier about the business side is to be able to state the business case. And so if you can identify a problem, put together a solution and then be able to explain the business case for that, it doesn't matter if you're public sector or private sector, you're still chasing dollars or time or program resources, people, something, Whatever it takes to bring that problem to a solution statement and explain why there's value back to the organization is a really important balance to have. And so the, I think the, the faster people can learn how to develop that skill, the more successful they will be. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Becky has any lessons learned. No. I mean, one, one that I, I took away from... Um, you know, something that I know now that I didn't know then is, is to pace yourself, um, uh, especially if, you, if you're on an operation for a long time, uh, don't burn yourself out right away. It's gonna be a long haul, um, you know, get up. You know, if it's, a, if it's a walk around the building or something like that, you also have to take care of yourself. Uh, and that's very important because uh, if you don't, you're not gonna be any good to anyone else, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Becky, nothing. That was unexpected that you would ask me. Um, I, I mean, of course, I love everybody's answers. I was thinking when you talked about learning from others, 
Um, oftentimes learning from the person you think, wow, what a terrible job that person has done or what a hellish leader I'm trying to work for or whatever it be, there's still tremendous value in learning and adopting and seeing uh, somebody else, uh, um, um, their lessons and their, and their um, experience and what they're learning and gathering from that. And sometimes when we're younger, I don't know why, but when you're younger, you kind of think you know everything already. And it's not, I used to joke that I was, I was so young, I, I knew everything. And when, as I got older, I realized I hardly know anything. So I think that is kind of the big one. I wish I had known a little bit better uh, in my earlier days. Yeah, so uh, the next question I always like to ask um, leaders in the field, and we'll start with Brad. Uh, so what keeps you up at night? I'd say the single most important thing that keeps me awake at night is the safety of our people. And that could be the people that are on the workforce out doing 24 seven jobs. That could be our tactical responders that are on the front lines. And I think anybody that's ever managed or led people that work the front lines will tell you that that's one of their biggest concerns is that the crews are safe and come home. And so doing what we can to keep them safe day is a day and night, 24, seven, 365 commitment. Mark. Yeah, I think I'd add, uh, say the same thing, uh, you know, at a very high level, you know, it's a safety of your people. I think at at my level, I want to put my head on the pillow at night and think that I've done everything possible to keep us prepared and keep us ready for any threat that, you know, that uh, that's going to pose and uh, present to us. You know, we all know that's impossible to do, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person that, you know, tries to cover everything and I, and I would, it would kill me if I knew I missed something that caused the safety of our people to be in jeopardy. So I think that's kind of what keeps most emergency managers, security professionals up uh, at night. Yeah, I think, I think you nailed it right there. So there are probably a lot of people that are on this uh, webinar and panel that uh, are interested in a career in emergency management or security management or kind of a combination of those. What advice would you give somebody who's, uh, you know, curious or wants to get into this field? And uh, we'll start with Mark. So I think uh, with any with any career, you have to start somewhere. So I think it's about persistence, being consistent. And I think one of the most important lessons is you're not going to get everything you look for. Uh, you're going to have some failures, uh, and that's okay. You learn. I think what uh, Becky just said. You learn from those failures just as much as you learn from the successes and probably more. Uh, so I would think, you know, you want to get involved and I know we're going to talk about it in a little bit, but, you know, internships, uh, volunteerism, whatever way you can get your feet wet or get involved is very important um, in, in getting involved in these fields. And obviously you want to get an education as much as you can at, at, our, at our program or any, any program, but ours is the best. So you want to get an education at our program. But um, my point is, you know, keep, keep, be persistent, keep involved. And uh, what I find a lot today, everybody wants to start at a high level, be willing to start at the, what I call the grunt level, where you got to do the things that you do and build from that. Uh, everybody can't start in the position we're in right now uh, on, you know, start, be willing to start at a low level and work your way up. And there's a lot of value in that as well. Brad, do you have anything to add? Sure. Yeah, absolutely agree with the idea of start with the tactical and some of the field level roles. Um, that's, that's invaluable experience. And some people will say, well, it feels like you're just wasting time or you're not moving quickly enough. But the, the experiences you're gaining there are really formative in developing perspective so that when you move into a role, when you're in the emergency manager role of more of the office and managerial space, you're building programs and systems and other things that help account for those different tactical activities. So to have the perspective to know how those people work and to know what's important to them and how they need to stay safe is hugely important because it's gonna make you more successful in leading and advocating for them later in your career. And certainly a piece of that is developing yourself professionally with education, as Mark said. Um, and I would also add, just uh, always dig, to, dig deeper and try, uh, try to understand the why. So a lot of people talk about what needs to be done, but to be a good problem solver, understand the why behind it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Both those answers are awesome. And, you know, you both talked about the balance between education and experience. You know, is, is there, in your opinion, is there is there a certain, um, you know, is, it, is there a right balance between the two? 
um, what would what would you suggest for somebody who wants to get in this field, uh, looking at both education and experience? And again, I'll pick on Mark first because he's, he's oh, that, that, my, you're in my upper uh, left hand side. There. I, I'm, I'm not a problem. Um, so what I think is uh, it. I don't. I think there is a good balance between the both. Obviously, in a perfect world, you'd, you'd have education and experience, but not everybody could be in that space. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, both are vitally and crucially important. I don't think you can put one above the other because they're both important. But as I, you know, as I look uh, and, and and see different areas and what people are looking at, I think it depends on the job that the job that the hiring manager is looking for. So what they're looking for, you know, sometimes even in my own field or my own uh, uh, team, you sometimes you need somebody that can just take the reins and run, and and that you don't have time. You just need somebody, and and that's what you're looking for. But sometimes, and and I've done this too, it's a it's a position where you're willing to let them grow and train and learn and, and move up. So I think that speaks to the what I just said a minute ago was, uh, you know, sometimes you know a little of both is you know a happy balance is best. But uh, you know, it also depends on what career, what job you're after. It depends on what they're looking for. And Brad. Completely agree. The only thing I would, I would add to that is to say that um, they don't have to be done sequentially. They can be done at the same time. So if somebody has the opportunity to go to school while working in the field and developing those field experiences, even if it takes a little longer to get through school, you're still building valuable experience in both realms. And so continue to pursue it and keep moving, keep growing. And don't, don't put it off and wait until you're going to do this next or after. Consider doing them at the same time and you'll find that both are valuable for you in both roles. That's great. So uh, we're, we're to the fun part of the panel discussion, which is, uh, you know, what, what do you guys enjoy most about what you do? Because I, I mean, you know, just talking with you all, you have tremendous responsibilities. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, what keeps you up at night? Uh, but but what keeps you coming back every day? And I'll go with Brad this time since I'm going at lower left. Okay. Give Mark a break. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really like the opportunity to help individuals grow and develop in their roles. And I also like the opportunity to really work on big systems and processes and develop, um, develop solutions to really complex problems and do a lot of dynamic risk assessment. Things are moving very quickly, as Mark has mentioned before, as I mentioned that the world around us changes a lot and we have to be ready to adjust and constantly be assessing, constantly be making slight adjustments to try to maintain the, the best outward programs we can. And that dynamic risk assessment is really fun and challenging. It's like playing a real-time living game of chess every day. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree uh, with Brad. I, I think what keeps keeps me coming back is kind of what we started this whole uh, tonight with. It's different every day. You know, you, you're not going to have two days uh, the, the same. So. Uh, you know, I don't know if I could be in a job that I did the same thing every day, uh, you know, without any kind of divergence. But in, in this in these fields, uh, absolutely uh, something different every day. And I enjoy the people that you're helping. So uh, you get to meet with so many different types of folks, at least in, in my current role. Uh, you know, not just uh, not just you would think I only meet with doctors and nurses, but there's a, a, an array of people I meet with that I never thought I would ever get to even know or, or appreciate. And, and you learn a lot from the people and you get a lot of appreciation um, from the people, uh, you know, from from the everyday folks who you work with, especially when um, and I'm sure Brad went through this this year with our last year, I should say what our uh, I'm not going to mention COVID. I'm going to say our, our overactive hurricane season uh, and and just talking to people, uh, one of my unintended hats I wear is I'm almost like the organization's weatherman. And uh, I can read the same weather report that's on the news, but since they trust what's coming from my mouth, they think it's, I have a super secret source and haven't told them it's Mike yet. But uh, anyway, I enjoy helping people. And if, if me reading the weather report to them makes them feel better and, and, and then, then that's what I love to do and it's something different. And you know, I've I've known both y'all for for a while now, five six years, and uh, I, I I gotta say, every time I talk to you guys, you're upbeat, you're positive, and and um, I think that's that's great. I mean, how, how you guys yeah you know have that attitude, it it bleeds into what what you do, 
Um, so that's great. You know, Mark, you, you mentioned something that was interesting, trust. How important is trust uh, in your job? Is it? I'm, I'm absolutely, extremely important. Um, I use the, the phrase quite often when I'm talking to my colleagues or, or my team, you know, we don't want to be chicken little. Uh, we, we don't want to underplay something, but we don't want to be chicken little that the sky is always falling or nobody will ever listen. So it takes a little time to build that trust and, and no matter whether it's emergency management or security or whatever feel. Uh, and once you get it, you can lose it very easily. It's harder to get, it's easy to lose. So you have to be careful because you don't, you want people to listen when you have to sound the alarm. Uh, hey, uh, and you want them to really listen. If you're always calling for, if you're always a prophet of doom or, or, or saying this is gonna be terrible, um, you know, they stop listening after a while and, and you never want that to happen. You want them to, you want to be calm, you want to be professional, but when need be, if you need to get people moving, you have to be, you know, you don't want to be an alarm, but you have to be, uh, uh, have that trust and hopefully it's reciprocal and, and you'll be very successful when, if you have that. What do you think, Brad? Any, uh... yeah. Absolutely agree. I think the, the relation, the trust and the relationships it takes to build that trust are really important. And for one, one of the big reasons for that is that in times when you need to pull together as a team the most in emergency management and emergency response are times when you're at peak stress. There are a lot of variables and a lot of unknowns. In some cases, there could be hazards involved and it could be dangerous work. And that's the time when you really need to be able to leverage that good working relationship with your team and know that and the team needs to know that they can trust you and you need to know you can trust their, the team to make good decisions, to advocate for each other's safety, to look after the mission. And that doesn't just happen because the emergency occurred. The foundation for that begins months and years before the event occurs. And so long-term long relationship building really helps foster that trust when you need it the most. Yeah. Can I follow up this trust question? Um, the government sometimes is challenged, and I realize private sector versus public sector, but is is challenged in withholding information rather than you know imparting it, so that those folks who might be affected by something, take a hurricane, what have you, or a terrorist threat, a man-made threat, a pandemic, um, that they they probably potentially could contribute to their own survival slash success slash coming through it, a victor, um, perhaps with a little bit more information. How do you balance that with maybe a need for to protect proprietary information or or to not cause any kind of alarm? How do you know at one point and how much information to impart? And maybe Brad, you could start and then Mark? Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, so for, I think that when anybody in the private sector um, has to recognize the difference between what you mentioned, the proprietary and the commercial and business issues, and safely managing the emergency at hand. And so once the emergency has occurred, the priorities are around protecting the people, minimizing the impact of the environment. Those are your focuses. The other things we can address later. And so that really helps to separate those conversations around to stick to the mission, stick to the objectives, if you wanna use ICS speak, but stick to the mission assignment of stabilize the scenario, protect the people around you, protect the community, protect the environment. And then later on, we'll figure out the other parts. No. And I, I would just add, I agree, uh, it, it's very difficult to answer your question. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's the big emergencies and, and uh, that, that you deal with every day, but there's the, the ones that come through uh, overnight and you're reading your intel briefing and, you know, there's a chance of an active shooter here. And, and, and then you have to really think carefully about that. If, you know, if I, if I tell, uh, you know, 2000 medical personnel, we might get an active shooter today, uh, uh, you know, what's going to happen. So you got to, you know, First of all, make sure you're getting good information. Second of all, try to figure out how you're going to mitigate that threat without alarming everyone. But you never want to withhold information unless the actual information would cause more of a problem than if the event actually happened, which is possible. Uh, so it's it's very difficult. The way I do it and my team does it, we bring in a lot of people. It's not just our decision. It's usually our PR folks, our leadership teams, and, and a, a lot of other people that get involved as to, you know, who do we have to tell, uh, uh, you know, how are we going to mitigate this threat and, 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 and to ham handle it that way. But it's not an easy process. Sometimes it's difficult. Yeah. And uh, I just want to go back to something that you were, you were talking about, Mark, about, you know, trust takes a long time to build and you can lose it very quickly. And uh, one, one thing I would pass on to everyone uh, on this uh, 
this panel, or not the panel, but everyone that's on the Zoom call. If you don't know the answer, that's, that's you know, just tell the person and go find it and let them know. Don't try to make something up because that's that's the quickest way to lose uh, any credibility or trust that you might have. Uh, and that's my soapbox for the evening. So um, we're coming up on, on the end of, of this formal session, uh, but I just wanted to kind of throw the floor open to both Mark and, and Brad. Is there anything that uh, you'd like to, to pass on that, that wasn't covered in, uh, in the questions and, and conversations that we've had? Or we can ask the questions first. We got four questions, is that okay? Sure. Okay, um, um, so let's start with Mark. Or uh, Mark, you start and then if Brad, if you would answer. We've got here, uh, when you left the public sector and entered the private sector, what were the biggest adjustments you had to make and what were the hardest adjustments? And it, it goes with another question we have that talks about this transition going from public to private. How, how kind of do you do that? I yeah, great question. Thank you uh, for the question. I think it's it's Brad had mentioned it earlier. It's learning the uh, the, the business model and how to put together a business plan. Uh, so you don't some, although uh, you do that a little bit in the, in the, in, the, in the public sector. It's really really important in the private sector. What's it going to cost? Uh, why are we doing this? How does it affect our bottom line? And then how does it fit with our organization's mission and vision? Uh, so I think that that was a little bit of an adjustment for me, although in the, the similarities in the public sector, like Brad said, you know, you still, whether it costs money or time or, or, or resources, you still kind of figure those things out. But I think it's a little more pronounced, at least in the healthcare sector, it is where they want to know why are we doing this? How is it going to help our organization? How is it going to help our patients? And do we really need to do this? Uh, so I think that was a, a bit of an adjustment, more, more verification and more validation of what you're trying to do. I absolutely agree. The only thing I would add to that is from my experience personally, uh, when I made the transition from public to private, since I went from the fire service into private company, um, I went from a role where I was rotational. So I was actually in a 24 hour shift work position to moving into a corporate job where I worked Monday to Fridays. And when I left the shift at the firehouse or at the ambulance station or what have you, um, somebody else was doing that job. And so when I was off, I was truly off. And when I made the switch, because I moved into a role that was not a rotational job in the private sector, there are those out there. I did not have one of those. But when I made that switch, there wasn't somebody else doing the job when I walked out the door. So the, the phone calls still come in. Uh, the problems that you were working on the night before are still going to be there in the morning when you come back. And so that was a bit of a lifestyle adjustment to me. And so figuring out the work-life balance in that was a bit of an adjustment as well. Okay, to follow up a little bit on this whole public versus private, and maybe this is one of those questions that really seeks a candid response, but are there rewards that might be different in the private sector than perhaps the public sector? We'll start with Brad, and then we'll go to Mark. Okay, for, from my personal experience, I think the biggest reward has been uh, the ability to broaden the scope of practice. And so I really enjoyed working in the fire service and in the EMS sector. Um, got very fantastic, really good experiences from that and, uh, and really enjoyed it. And I was also curious about how to do that more and take on bigger responses to build bigger programs. And so moving into a role where I had the opportunity to do international work and to um, build and work with responders in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, it was one of the most rewarding parts for me. Um, and that was really what I was looking for and pursuing and was happy to find that in the private sector. So I, I think Brad's right. I, I think for me, the rewards are pretty much the same. It's the scope and the, 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 the scope of what, what I'm doing now versus what I did before that's different. So uh, the, to me, the rewards, you're still dealing with people. They're still grateful if you, you, know, if you help them. Uh, the kind of things we talked about earlier uh, still make me make me go. It's just in my current position versus my old position, the scope's a lot larger. Okay. Um, um, students, of course, and folks who have joined us tonight are very keen on the internships, um, how, where these kind of opportunities exist, how they find them, whether you two gentlemen uh, um, held internships, and if so, what your experience might have been. Um, Mark, would you like to tackle it first? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, I, I will tell you, uh, I've had several interns work with me at Oshner that were students of mine or students in the program at Tulane. Uh, and, and we do have uh, an internship program at, at, at my current organization. 
Uh, but a lot of it, I think you find it by networking, whether you're in a program like this or you're in a field like this and you talk to folks like myself or Brad or, or Mike or, or Becky, uh, and you just talk and try to try to get into the field and, and find out where there are. Uh, most of ours are unpaid, but you, you, you're getting paid just not financially. You're getting paid by experience and, and uh, learning, learning the field. Uh, and I did not personally, I was not in an internship, but I wish I would have been uh, years ago. Or even voluntary, uh, even voluntary duties for either of you, if, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of getting experience. Yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities like that in uh, city or parish government or potentially in state government okay. channels. And that gives you a really good perspective on what's happening in the entirety of the community. And so you get to see what different industries are doing. You get to see what different jurisdictions or, and cities or parishes are doing uh, or counties, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities in that space and those experiences carry across. I mean, I think Mark and I are both examples of that, that starting in the local government realm is really a great foundation for being able to move into the private sector. Um, there are not as many of emergency management jobs in the private sector um, depending on where you're trying to enter the system. And so starting with the internship um, at the local level is just a fantastic opportunity to get started. That, that's how I got started, you know, all kinds of voluntary gigs. And, and I never got turned down. If I walked in somewhere and said, well, maybe it can help you write your um, animal rescue, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and transportation annex, boy, sure, you bet. Don't leave the office until it's done. So a plan, and that was a great way to build that network as well. So maybe you could tell us some other ideas for how folks can build those networks or how we should be exploiting these networks or leveraging them. Um, Brad, did you want to start? Sure. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities to attend public meetings that occur in the emergency management space. So if your jurisdiction has a uh, an LEPC or local emergency planning committee, that's really a, a reoccurring meeting that's a gathering a lot of emergency response uh, focal points for private sector and public sector to come together and share information and um, and share preparedness tactics, techniques, et cetera, like this. So that's a really good way to get started because you can network and meet a lot of people that might have a pathway to internships. Also looking around, if you have an ultimate goal of going to work for a large organization, a large hospital, a large company, et cetera, look for the other service companies that work for them and do contract work for them. And sometimes that's a really good entry point because they might have more roles because you could spend a percentage of your time with this company and a percentage of your time with another company. And in that consulting space, you build a lot of experience for what multiple large companies are doing. And you can find best practices out of each of those and apply that as you develop your own style. Okay, thank you. No, I, I would I, I would agree with Brad, um, I, and I think I go back to what you said, Becky, is is volunteer help, uh, or or just reach out to folks like myself, Mike, you, uh, Brad. Uh, you know, most of our colleagues in this line of work are very very nice people, uh, and I don't know any of them that would turn you down if you wrote them and say, "Hey, I need a little advice in my career," uh, especially through the university or, or really through through anything. Uh, you know, we usually love helping people into the business because this is our life's work and we like it. So we want to help people. I've, uh, I've had several students that become interns at, uh, with me and my team and, and write, you know, letters for them and, and really get them into the network. Even if it's, even if they don't ultimately end up working in my organization, if you can get them into the field and get them, I think like what Brad said, get them volunteering, get them, uh, on, on those local boards, uh, nobody's going to turn down help in this field because oftentimes we need it badly. It seemed, it seemed to me that students are successful sometimes making an appointment, going in to see the security manager, or emergency manager and saying, here's the skills that I bring. I, I know how to do risk assessments. I've learned how to do vulnerability analysis. What This is what we're studying right now. I'm working on my capstone or whatever it might be and being able to kind of pitch whatever it is. Um, um, another thing you had mentioned, I think you've each mentioned at some point, and it might be partly the future of our fields is consultancy or consultant models or even specialized kind of lanes. And we see having come from FEMA where a lot of times folks were contracted to perform certain functions. Any comments or thoughts on, on kind of the future of that where somebody doesn't necessarily look for an opportunity, they might actually create opportunities such as consultancy models. Uh, I think uh, there's- Mark? Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely think there's a big a big need for that out there, and it, it's growing all the time. I think, uh, not, you know, not only because of COVID, but hurricanes, you name it, across the country. I think more and more businesses are seeing the need for emergency management, not just your traditional 
uh, businesses that have it uh, because of what's going on around us. Uh, it's not getting any less. And even, even, even like healthcare systems who have traditionally regulated, so they have to have some form of emergency management, they're expanding it. Uh, you know, Brad can talk about his field, but I think uh, being in the consultant realm uh, and getting some experience there is, is, is a growing field right now. And I think there's gonna be a lot of need for that uh, coming up in future years. Yeah, I agree. I think that another opportunity with that in the consulting space and also in just the professional development space is to look at emergency management and homeland security, but also look at the role that business continuity has in that. And business continuity or continuity of operations, continuity of government, each of those terms are really important. They're distinctly different and they have different skills and different uh, kind of principles to them, but they're very much interrelated. And so if you're looking at going private sector or if you're looking at moving in the public through the public sector toward the private sector those skill sets are going to be very transferable and so it just broadens your exposure and it broadens your skill set so that you're more marketable in the future yeah and I also think, oh go ahead know, go mike in that um you, know, you all have been talking about you know uh some people worry that they don't have any skills in this field and and you'd be amazed about how many skills that a person doesn't think they have that, that can be applied to this field, both emergency management and security management. Um, so, uh, you know, for a lot of students out there, for students or people who want to be in this field, you know, don't sell yourself short. You, you, you know, whether you speak a language or you can, uh, you know, have computer skills or you served in the military or whatever, you do bring skills to, to the jobs. And that's another good thing about uh, you know, reaching out to professionals in the field like Mark and Brad and, and Becky um, to, to talk about that. And, and like Mark said, I, I don't know anyone who's ever turned down somebody, uh, who, who wants advice. You, you mentioned too about, um, the different skill sets and the, you two gentlemen are very articulate. You're not, you know, you're on your toes, you're taking and fielding our questions and, and being remarkable in this. So these are the kind of things that maybe students aren't thinking about, oral and written communication skills, right? A critical mind. And these are things you can develop. You don't have to have been born with them or, or earn those. One of our students talks about how does a person, maybe a little bit older, which let's be honest, I got into emergency management and I was older than dirt when I did. So when that happened, um, um, with maybe they don't have military experience, maybe they weren't first responders, maybe they're doing a complete change in their uh, a career path or in their life, or maybe they spend a lot of time with their family and now the kids are grown and they want to get into this. What kind of um, advice would you have for those folks who aren't maybe going along a traditional course toward emergency management, but now would like to serve in these fields? Either one, jump in there. <laughs> no, okay, I'll go. I, I, I would say be bold. Uh, what I didn't say in my introduction is I, you know, I went to law school at 43 and graduated 47. Uh, uh, and took the bar. Uh, so it's never too late. Um, you know, you just need to jump in, be bold. Uh, be, you know, we have a saying, and, and, I, and I'm going to forget the author that said it, but there's a saying, humble, hungry, and smart. And that's what any good organization would want in any career field. So you have skills that you probably don't even leverage. Uh, uh, you know, it's never too late to learn. Uh, you have life life experiences, and I think you just have to be willing to jump in there and try, and, and you'd be amazed uh, what you can accomplish uh, when you do that. Brad? Yeah, I, I would suggest somebody that, the, the example you brought up, somebody that might be starting school a little bit later in life or making a career shift when they didn't think they were going to, but you're in school making that, that your progress toward that. So if you already made the decision to go back to school, you're already making progress in that regard. So give yourself credit for taking that first leap to even start and just keep going. You know, learn as you go. And experiences that apply to emergency management are very broad and sometimes they'll surprise you. There are things we get into and the, the what if scenarios can come at you every single day. So full disclosure, I've never worked at Costco, but I think that somebody that's worked at Costco has been given baseline training about emergency management because if you were checking the uh, the receipts before somebody went out the door, you know a little bit about loss protection. If you were checking the security to make sure the doors in the back of the building were all locked at the end of the shift, you know a little bit about security. If you ever got trained about what to do if there was a fire and how to keep your customers prepared, you know, safe and get them out of the evacuation out of the store, you're learning about emergency management. So you know, recognize that there are a lot of day-to-day -day skills that we just repurpose into emergency management skills. In fact, you're already starting at school and you're pursuing it. You're on this you know, webinar right now. You're already taking the right steps. So just keep going and trust it. 
Hey, thank you. Yeah, he specifically, or, or this individual specifically talks about being a planner, not realizing that we're using planning techniques every single day. And if it's a formal way of planning, there are opportunities to go out and really kind of self-coach yourself or take emergency planning or even, you know, take independent studies and things that don't necessarily cost you something more and practice it, practice, be involved in the community's exercise or what have you. It's up to you, Mike. That concludes our questions. All right, thank you very much. So uh, you, I want to, again, thank both you all. I know you've both had long days and I really appreciate you all taking the time to be on this panel and answer our questions and give some, some great uh, information and thoughts to uh, students and, and people who are interested in this field. Uh, the one last thing I have for you all is, is, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to, to tell, to pass on to everyone? Um, I'll go. I just, you know, I, I, I just like to wrap up and say, you know, you never, it's never too late to learn. It's never too late to, to start into school. Uh, when I, when I teach, uh, I, I stress that all, all semester long, because I was a late in life student and I, and I think, uh, you know, as Brad has said, and Mike and everybody, uh, it's never too late. So please do not think you ever too, too late to do anything. Uh, you have skills, you have uh, things you have already developed, and, and, and the sky is the limit if you want to do it, you want to work hard, and you want to put time into it. And, and this is two great fields that, that I personally love, and, and, and I think you would too if you got into it. So I think uh, uh, thanks for, for listening, and I'll pass it to Brad. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and thanks, you know, Mike, and thank you for having us here and uh, the opportunity to share with you all. You know, I think my parting words or suggestions, folks, is just to keep an open mind about the possibilities of emergency management. I think I've spoken with some bias on my end, but it's a growing field. It's an exciting field, and people are finding new ways to apply emergency management to different industries and different problems, and it's getting much broader in its scope. And so a lot of times people hear emergency management, they hear homeland security, and they think military, law enforcement, FEMA. And that's about it. But it's so much broader and more diverse than that, and it's in demand. And I just did a quick little search before we got on this call at current activities that are happening in the world around us today. You've got a blizzard happening in California. You have a mudslide happening in California. There's a nitrogen leak in an industrial facility in Georgia today. There's a potential for a typhoon off the coast of Northeast Australia. You've got a global or a famine, excuse me, that's occurring in East Africa right now. And you have a social unrest that's in Poland in the midst of a global pandemic that we're all very well aware of anytime you turn on the news. And so um, think about the private sector and public sector implications of all of those. And I hope you all were you know, intrigued by what you heard here and to continue to hear about all the possibilities that emergency management, Homeland Security will present um, and continue to pursue this as a career path. Thank you. Well, again, I, thank you so much, both of y'all. Uh, again, I know you have both have had long days, so I really appreciate you being on this panel and, and volunteering your time and, and knowledge. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. We do have some uh, upcoming events. You can see the two. Uh, there's tips to help you uh, get into this field. Uh, and that will be um, blocks, unfortunately. That'll be March 10th. And then uh, we'll also have another panel uh, on Wednesday, April 28th. How did they do it? Hear from successful leaders in emergency and security fields. So hopefully you will uh, also find time to attend these upcoming webinars. Uh, we have uh, some incredible people that uh, we're going to invite to be on these panels. And then also, as, as Mark and Bradley said, for if you are interested in this field or if uh, you want to find out more, uh, we do offer degrees in Homeland Security, Emergency Management and Security Management. And myself and Becky would love to talk to you about uh, these degrees or if you have any questions about these fields or things that you can do with these degrees. Uh, here, are, here is our, uh, or here are our contact information. Um, you can see my email there, Dr. Rouse's. And then for any admissions questions, you can uh, contact Dr. Sheila Gold and her email is right there. But again, thank you very much. Hope you all have a good night, stay safe, and thank you again to our panelists. Thanks.